Yeah, so yeah, thanks, thanks, Harrison. Thanks, Laura and Joe for inviting me to speak today. Um, again, one of the, I'm one of the founders and the CEO of Swift Solar, which is working on bringing perovskite tandem solar cells to market. And I imagine that today we have a, folks from all kinds of backgrounds in the audience, uh, from students to perovskite researchers to investors. So please bear with me if I'm telling you things that you already know. I'm sure I will. So anyway, our mission at Swift is to build a world where all energy is clean energy. And this has been true since the very first meeting between the six co-founders. We talked a lot about hopes and dreams, and it was pretty clear that what we all wanted was first to help fight climate change and second to build clean energy products that serve the people who, who need energy most. Right? So that's why we started Swift. That's how we've built the company and the team. And that's where I want to start today. Um, as a society, we need to deploy lots of solar PV because we need to do something about climate change. And we often think of climate change as some far off problem for some island nation that's thinking under the sea or for our grandchildren to deal with, but it's an ex existential risk today. So almost every major problem we face in the world today is either caused by or amplified by climate change. Everything from heat waves to power outages to pandemics and refugee crises, they're all linked to climate in some way. So climate change got real personal for a lot of us in 2020. Uh, this is a photo I took last September from my front door. And the orange sky, the raining ash, are all caused by these massive wildfires that we saw on the entire West Coast and even in Colorado. Um, and these wildfires are very closely linked to the about 150 million trees that have died in California since 2013. Um, that's partly because of drought, right, which both weakens the trees and makes them more vulnerable to things like bark beetles which tend to hatch earlier and reproduce more frequently in these warmer winters that are caused by climate change. Um, we also see an increase in lightning strikes, which are a major cause of dangerous wildfires. And we expect that with the higher temperatures, we'll get even more thunderstorms and lightning, um, something like 12% per degree Celsius of warming in the US. And just overall, we've seen that the frequency of days in California, fall days in California with extreme fire weather has actually increased uh, by 2x um, since, the, since, the, since the 1980s, and it's only going to keep getting worse. This is also true for COVID, actually. So infectious diseases, by definition, involve interactions between species, right? A host and a pathogen, sometimes with factors in between. So infectious diseases rise when humans come into closer contact with animals, which happens when habitats, habitats are destroyed by drought. Um, or wildfires or flooding or anything else from climate change. We also see diseases rise when vectors like mosquitoes and ticks spread, and that includes when higher temperatures increase their metabolism or when increased flooding um, gives them more breeding sites. And diseases also rise directly when people are more likely to get sick, which is what we see with more extreme temperature swings and warmer winters, uh, which, which actually reduces herd immunity in subsequent years. And the scary thing is that these impacts aren't actually isolated, so extreme weather can also increase infection rates and so on. So with all that said, um, what are we going to actually do about climate? And the easy answer is to stop digging, right? Stop drilling, stop fracking, stop burning fossil fuels, and start using other energy sources that don't emit carbon. You all know this already. And it turns out that solar PV is a pretty way to, a good way to get zero carbon electricity. So here we're showing the life cycle carbon intensity in terms of grams of CO2 equivalents per kilowatt hour uh, for all the different electricity generation technologies we have. And obviously coal and gas are not, not so good. Gas is generally better, but if you count for methane leakage, it's probably not that much better. Um, and certainly we have a, a whole array of possible low carbon technologies, including PV, which does pretty well. It's about um, life cycle right now, about 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Thin films a bit lower. So that was for silicon. Thin films are maybe more like 20 to 30. And these will only go lower as we decarbonize the grid. Um, sunlight isn't very energy dense, so you need lots of land, uh, but it's actually less than most people think. So uh, a lot of times we think of, you know, covering whole states with solar um, to power the whole U.S., but it, in fact, um, this nice figure from my friend Patrick shows that um, we only need this little square. It's pretty small, right? So this little square 
um, to, to satisfy all of U.S. electricity demand with PV. Um, and that's with average efficiency. Um, so if you actually go ahead and put in Arizona, you need less. Um, so this, this is a good amount of land, but it's not that much, especially if you're looking at comparing this to the amount of area we use for coal mining, uh, which is right about the same, uh, or even combining missile testing ranges and golf courses, you kind of get the same amount of area as well. Or you only need about 50% of the area we use for corn ethanol. So all of these suggest that you know there are a lot of uses of land that we could easily replace with solar um, and, and end up doing pretty well um, on the climate side. Obviously, we're not looking to go 100% solar. That's not, not the optimal uh, choice for the grid, but certainly land isn't going to be limiting. And on top of that, everyone has access to sunlight globally. So obviously, right? So here we're showing the, the solar density in terms of um, megawatts per square kilometer. Um, this is just a, a measure of density um, on the same scale as, as on the x-axis for uranium and oil. And you, these are at log scales, but on the same scale. So you can see that solar varies by about a factor of four from the sunniest country, which is Azerbaijan, and the cloudiest, Norway. Right. So if you look at other energy resources like uranium, uh, for example, you have a thousand X variation between countries or oil where you have a million X. Um, those are way less equitably distributed. And probably most importantly, solar PV has already been used at large scale. It's affordable compared to fossil fuels. Um, we've seen that PV is actually on track to surpass wind in, in the global installed capacity in 2021. Uh, with over 600 gigawatts already installed. And about 10 years ago, I mean, terawatt scale solar sounded super far away, but now we're almost there. Um, so PV has gone from super expensive to super cheap in the last 40 years, dropping from about $8 a kilowatt hour in 1975 equivalent, which is something like a utility bill of $7,000 a month for a typical household in the U.S., uh, to less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour in 2020, right, where it's now the most affordable source of electricity for a lot of the world. So LCOE obviously isn't the whole story because sunlight is variable and intermittent, but the the cost of storing that energy, that excess energy from when the sun is out with lithium ion batteries, is also coming down at an insane rate. So it is because of this huge progress in solar PV in the last 10 years that a lot of people now say solar is solved. Right, Silicon has won. We should instead go work on agriculture or cement or steel, or electric aviation, or fusion, um, or something else. And obviously, everyone wants to work on and invest in the more unsolved problems. So that's the dominant narrative, solar is solved. And honestly, I think it's true for the most part, at least on the surface. This wasn't obviously true 10 years ago, or even five years ago. But now there's good evidence that we can likely eliminate about 90% or more of power sector emissions without a whole lot of change in the average cost of electricity, right, using just existing technologies, um, things like PV, wind, hydro, lithium ion, um, and new transmission. And there's some nice work by Saul Griffith and others that shows that you could scale up renewables and electrify everything using EVs and heat pumps and batteries, and that, that alone can actually eliminate something like 70 to 80% of U.S. emissions by 2035. So that's with no new technologies. So today, I actually believe that silicon is probably good enough. Uh, we don't need to wait for perovskites or other new te technologies, PV technologies, to solve most of that climate problem. Um, and that's actually really good for the world. But personally, I also think it would be a huge mistake to stop innovating in PV technology. Just about every single low-carbon pathway, every integrated assessment model, every power system model that I've seen relies heavily on PV to lead the way in decarbonizing the power sector. So that means that even a small change in LCOE can make a huge difference, right? The 10 to 30% savings you might get from making PV more efficient and easier to install could translate to on the order of $100 billion of value per year in the U.S. alone. But today we're systematically underinvesting in new solar technology. So here's some data on most of the high-profile U.S. solar investments over the last 20 years or so, and a bunch of companies raised hundreds of millions of dollars in 2006 to 2012 to, to build the next big thing, right? And if you haven't seen a bubble freeze, this is what it looks like. Um, after Solyndra blew up in 2011, after over a billion dollars raised, 
um, U.S. investments in solar PV basically froze for the rest of the decade. Um, so I've seen this firsthand during fundraising, right? I've had uh, VCs say that their LPs won't let them invest in solar after Solyndra. So this is clearly a barrier. Um, this, this kind of um, rise and fall has been a barrier to continuing to fund new solar technologies. So in the last decade, solar startups in the U.S. weren't really getting funded, but in the background, obviously technology was still improving steadily. So perovskites, this new technology, have now surpassed every other thin film in small area cell efficiency. But a lot of um, there, there's been very little private funding that's gone to, to U.S. PV companies during the same period. So over the last three years, it's only been something like $20 million in total that's gone into U.S. startups building new new and emerging PV technologies. And just for comparison, in the same time period, we've seen over 400 million invested in nuclear fusion, the same amount invested in waste disposal startups. Um, so anyway, my goal here is not to, obviously not to downplay the importance of zero carbon baseload power or sustainable waste treatment. But if we are gonna rely on solar to solve 20 to 50% of the climate problem, and if we're spending trillions of dollars deploying solar worldwide in the next 30 years and indefinitely after that, it seems worth it to keep making it better. So silicon is the only PV technology we ever have. It's not the end of the world for climate, but we are missing out on a huge opportunity to build a cleaner and more equitable world. So as we look forward to a potential future for perovskites, I think it's useful to look at why previous solar startups struggled and what we can learn from them. I think there are a few different factors worth considering. I mean, some of these include just bad timing to enter the market when China was scaling up silicon PV massively. The choice to compete with silicon head-on on price, which forced them to scale up factories too early. Um, so you spend hundreds of millions of dollars on factories that are running not completely proven processes, which ultimately led to running out of money before finding product market fit and ultimately selling the company to questionable acquirers. And a lot of these things are difficult to control, right? They're, a lot of them are, are issues of circumstance or macroeconomic um, realities. But anyway, it's not a pretty picture. And we have to look at these failure mode learning opportunities and try to chart a different path. So to kind of walk through these, some of the learnings you might get, I mean, fundamentally, the world in 2020 is different from the world of 2010 for a lot of reasons. Um, and we importantly now have some real public awareness and momentum on climate change. Uh, we know where China stands. Uh, governments do seem to be more aware of the strategic importance of energy and domestic manufacturing. And with things like SPACs and other capital sources, uh, for better or for worse, we're, we're starting to see new pathways to growth capital and exits for clean tech, which was non-existent in the first clean tech wave. We also know not to underestimate China and Silicon where the targets for cost floors and efficiency ceilings are always moving. We need to outperform rather than undercut silicon and also find customers who will pay for good products and not just cheap products. And of course, another option is to uh, couple perovskites with silicon in a tandem cell. Another important learning is to develop technology and manufacturing processes and find that product market fit before you go and build and scale up your factories. And maybe the ultimate learning, a uh, very important learning at least, is that product market fit and unit economics matter. So new PV technologies need to have products that have good unit economics. They need to have a financing plan that matches their market strategy, um, which could include mission-aligned private investors um, and government support. And I think it's really important to recognize the value of government support here. Uh, which really should be sustained even in the face of high-profile failures. Um, one of the shining stars of Cleantech 1.0 was Tesla, which uh, some people may know funded its first factory with, with DOE vehicle manufacturing loans and actually has been supported heavily by EV subsidies and emissions credits. So a lot of possible learnings we could take from the last generation. Um, so to kind of look forward, I just want to start to introduce some of the new technologies, including perovskites and lay out the landscape a bit. So there's many ways you can try to classify and organize PV technologies. Um, one way is to use material complexity as a sort of a guiding metric. And this is very hand wavy, uh, but you can kind of say, look at an, a spectrum from 
things like crystalline silicon, which are wafer based, have very relatively simple materials, you know, single atoms in a in a unit uh, structure um, in a basis. But then you have very complex processing, uh, very high temperatures, uh, requires crystallization, doping, things like that. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, you have things like quantum dots and organic molecules, which are very complex if you look at the the building blocks of these materials. Uh, but they are processed in very simple ways at low temperatures. And these materials on the right side, these emerging materials, including perovskites, tend to be more abundant. They tend to be more tolerant to impure precursors and disorder. So you can actually manufacture them more cheaply in many cases. And those lower process temperatures, lower manufacturing temperatures, are a big advantage. So perovskites and other emerging technologies can be manufactured at below 200 Celsius, 200 degrees Celsius, compared to 500 plus for silicon and commercial thin films like Cattell and SIGS. And these lower temperatures reduce your energy use. They make it easier to design equipment, uh, for example, compared to SIGS and Cattell. And they don't melt uh, cheap and flexible plastic substrates, which is helpful. So in that direction, if you're looking to make a very high powered weight or very lightweight solar panel, you really need to go to very thin substrates. And these are important for, for mobile or portable solar applications. Um, and this is showing the specific power in watts per gram uh, against the thickness of different substrates. So these are on log log, this is on a log log scale. So, you know, obviously these efficiencies are a bit dated, but linear changes don't really matter. It's a log scale. So in any case, um, at the thick substrates, you obviously have uh, the substrates dominating the weight of the full, full module or the full cell. And in contrast, as you go to the left to a regime where you have very thin substrates, you get to a point in the limit where active layers dominate the weight. And in reality, you're going to be somewhere in between these. Uh, but it's only when you get to this left side where the active layers start to dominate that um, having these lightweight, thin, flexible active layers really matters. So props get start to shine when you go to thinner substrates alongside other emerging PV technologies. So at MIT, we did a silly thing and we put a solar cell on a soap bubble. Um, this is obviously pretty useless, um, but we did this to show sort of what you could do in the limit of, of having a very thin substrate, a very lightweight solar cell. And we were able to achieve over 6,000 watts per kilogram. Uh, so that's like a whole rooftop installation in a kilogram, right? So quite a lot of power in a small lightweight package. This is actually an organic solar cell, not a perovskite. One more thing is that because these um, emerging these emerging technologies use abundant materials that are produced in high volumes, um, they can often reach terawatt scale deployment without requiring a lot of growth in production um, of the raw elements. So, you know, you compare silicon, which needs about six years of silicon production to satisfy all world electricity demand, if you were to use 100% silicon PV. Um, tellurium, you need something like 1,400 years, and this has been um, kind of the, the dead horse that's been beaten alive for Cattell. Um, and I do want to emphasize that you don't need to satisfy all electricity demand to be a useful technology, so don't want to downplay this. Uh, but certainly when you look at the emerging thin films on the right side, you need something like less than three years for all these technologies to generate all the materials, all the raw materials you need to produce terawatts of electricity, um, something like 25 terawatts um, with all of this single technology. Uh, so that's actually really important from a macro perspective. It lets you, um, if you can avoid having to actually increase the production volume of these materials, then you're, you're not limited by, by mining. You're not limited by by-production dynamics of how these raw elements are produced. Um, and all those things make you a less risky technology in the end when you're looking at large scale. So the point of all this is that emerging solar technologies do have some fundamental advantages compared to silicon. Um, in terms of weight, flexibility, uh, potentially efficiency, abundance, and cost, manufacturing, um, a lot of potential advantages. And anyway, we're all here because we want to see these advantages realized in the market, and perovskites are certainly the most promising. Um, so let's look at a few ways that perovskites might actually be useful in real applications. So a natural use case for perovskites is in low Earth orbit and space, uh, where there's SpaceX and OneWeb and others are looking to deploy thousands of satellites to provide internet connectivity around the world. 
So this could be tens of megawatts each year of solar and uh, market size of hundreds of millions uh, for the solar alone. And perovskites here have a natural advantage because they can be lighter weight, more efficient, and radiation hard, it turns out, than silicon cells. Another application is powering unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, and airships for months at a time using only sunlight. So you can do a lot of things with UAVs, but one ex exciting application to me is you can bring internet and communication services also to remote areas or improve them. So if you have a group of people spread out in a rural area without access to a cell tower, you can actually introduce a UAV um, or a network of UAVs flying ahead in the stratosphere and that can act like a flying cell tower and create a network um, that acts as a go-between to link people to base stations. So you can think of these UAVs as a complementary form of pseudo-satellite, easier to launch and easy, actually recoverable. And they're fully dependent on efficient, lightweight solar. So leading aerospace companies, a lot of them are actually working on building these platforms. So it's still early days for the applications that I just described, but there's actually a lot of weight behind them. And we can help unlock this market by making lightweight and efficient solar cells um, in a more affordable way than conventional space cells. One application that's actually really interesting to me is, is looking at solar water pumping and other productive loads in India. Um, this is obviously uh, coming, from, coming out of the MIT Grid Edge Solar Program, which is entirely focused on these kind of applications. Uh, but if you look at um, India's electricity, about 20% of it is used for agriculture today. And a lot of that is for irrigation. And irrigation is super important, but a lot of the small farmers actually don't have consistent access to grid power. So solar water pumps have become an interesting way to bridge that gap. So the Indian government's actually aiming to deploy something like 1.7, 1.75 solar pumps in the next few years, uh, which is a multi-gigawatt market and potentially higher. And um, the importance here is that um, if you if you want to be able to share panels, uh, a lot of the farmers actually share share the economics and avoid theft. Um, you need portable, lightweight, probably rollable panels that can be moved around and set up by a single person. And there's a lot of companies working on these kind of solutions already in India. Um, there are many of them based on crystal and silicon today. Uh, Clara Energy, Adam, and Karma, for example, these are photos taken by by our Grid Edge teammates um, who who basically you know saw these use cases, and you can see that they're they're on wheels, uh, which is really interesting. They're often put on carts, and weight naturally is, is a challenge here. These are human-powered solar, um, mobile solar. Um, so you can actually look at powering all kinds of other productive loads as well, right? So things like uh, sugar cane or fruit juicing machines for street vendors. Um, on the right, we have electric rickshaws for short-distance transport, um, wheat threshing, weaving, all kinds of agricultural um, productive loads as well. And I think learning from Anurag Panda over at MIT, um, in particular, and the Grid Edge team in general, I think the e-rickshaw market on the right is actually really interesting. Uh, it's a very large market, and these things are often used as a last mile connection uh, for a few tens of kilometers per day. And you can actually retrofit them to do a lot of things. And they have a hard time getting access to power since they're often just standing on the road uh, during the day and they're off-grid. So lightweight solar can make a lot of sense there, too. But going back to, to the U.S. or, or more globally, uh, we can also help open up a, a new class of self-charging EVs, solar-powered EVs, cars and trucks and buses that charge themselves with sunlight. So a lot of people think that sunlight's not energy-dense enough to power vehicles. But if you actually go through the calculations, you find that if you have solar that's efficient enough, you can actually drive something like 5,000 miles a year on sunlight, or almost half your annual miles. So with a relatively small upfront investment, right, a couple, couple thousand dollars, maybe a thousand dollars, you can actually get a lot of convenience of plugging in your car a lot less often, um, the peace of mind of having that extra source of power, now, even cost in and CO2 savings from not charging with grid power. So I think that's pretty cool. And finally, because perovskite technology is flexible, uh, we can start to make solar integrated roofing products that roofers can install the same way and same time that they install your new roof, which could actually drive down the cost of residential solar dramatically, largely by reducing soft costs um, and help make it more affordable for almost every household. So obviously this has been tried before a few times with six products and more for silicon products, but from, to my knowledge, it's never been done with tech that actually can be more efficient and more affordable than silicon. 
So perovskites really open up, I think, a new opportunity in this in this range, in this domain. And especially for this market, I, sorry, for this audience, I, I think um, it's important to recognize that these are all viable markets for perovskites made in the USA. Right. So these the, the economics work out such that you can manufacture in the USA and, and serve all of these different markets. So there's a lot of strategic importance for the country, I think, in, in being able to open up these applications and deploy perovskites. Anyway, I know some of you wanted to hear, you probably showed up here to hear what we're up to at Swift. So let me quickly introduce the, the team and the company. So these are the, the founders of Swift. We have six co-founders coming from five different countries. And we've worked together on this technology for a lot of the past decade. So several, several of us um, you know, have been, had a lot of intertwining paths. So Thomas and I actually were actually classmates um, at Stanford during undergrad and through PhDs and postdocs at MIT, Oxford, and Stanford. And ultimately, we came together at NREL in 2018 to launch Swift. And I'll just say that my co-founders are all world leaders in the field of perovskites. They're pioneers of perovskite tandems. Um, and on the team, we have experts across many aspects of solar technology and techno-economics. And we've been lucky to add team members and advisors who have really helped push the industry forward over the past 20 years or so. So we started with six people. We have 18, including a couple awesome interns and part-time folks. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is that we have people from 10 different countries out of 18 people, uh, which maybe just goes to show how international of a community the Perovskite and solar research is, um, and hopefully how globally we can deploy solar as well. So a quick rundown of the numbers. Um, we've raised about $16 million in equity financing, only about $1.4 million from traditional VCs. Uh, for a lot of the reasons that I named earlier. We, have, again, have 18 team members and nine PhDs, uh, for better or for worse. A lot of PhDs sitting around. Um, and we have four federal grants. And we've been able to use that funding to actually build out a, a facility. We have 10,000 square feet in San Carlos, California. It's about half lab and half office. And it's completely tailored for perovskite development. So the design of our lab pools from our team's experience at a lot of the leading labs from NREL, Stanford, Oxford, and elsewhere. Um, and we have equipment for making cells and mini modules for testing cell performance and testing product reliability. And the technology that we're focusing on um, that we believe is the future uh, for perovskites is all perovskite tandems. So again, the core advantages of perovskites are that they can be formed from these abundant and low-cost precursors at low temperatures, but they still have this very, very high, high quality, right? You can create high-quality semiconductors at these low temperatures. Um, which means you can make a very efficient solar cell with a thin film. And a particularly interesting property is that you can actually tune the colors of light um, by tweaking the material composition. So we stack two perovskite cells on top of each other. So one absorbs the UV and more blue light, um, transmits the red and near infrared, which gets absorbed in the second cell. And because you're optimizing each cell for a narrower part of the spectrum, you can make a tandem that's much more efficient at converting sunlight into electricity than a typical cell. So obviously the leading technology today is silicon. It's about 95% of the market. It's been in the lab since the 1950s. Um, and it's creeped up in efficiency, right? It's still going up um, at the cell level, up to a theoretical limit of about 29.5%. And process single junctions, we know, came around around 2010. Um, and our team members have been at the forefront of this, really helping advance the technology to over 25% today. But these single junction cells are always going to hit a ceiling around 30% as well. So what we find exciting about tandems, um, both all perovskite and perovskite silicon tandems, is that they've improved just as quickly and they can break through that ceiling. So they can ultimately reach efficiencies as high as around 32 or so percent in the near term and well over 40 percent eventually um, in theory. So this is the exact same strategy that's been used successfully with other semiconductors with specifically 3-5 materials like gallium arsenide. Um, and they treat, they've reached efficiencies as high as 39% with six junctions, uh, but they also cost like $10,000 a square meter, so 100x more than silicon. And what the perovskites offer is the same kind of performance, uh, maybe uh, almost as good a performance at a cost that's actually lower than silicon, uh, and that's a game changer. 
So if you want to go ahead and make an all process guide tandem, you have to think about the entire stack and the entire module structure. And how do you design this, right? So there's a lot of pieces. Um, on the low gap cell, you need to make um, a, a low gap process guide, which usually introduces tin to the material, which tends to produce stability challenges. Uh, so you need to be able to make a stable and efficient pro low gap process guide. You also need to make a stable and efficient wide gap process guide, which introduces bromine, um, which can cause phase segregation and other stability challenges as well. Um, you need a rear electrode that actually physically blocks ions from reaching a metal contact or simply just doesn't react with ions in the perovskite and other layers. And these problems usually show up over time, over longer times, so we need to be, be aware of these. Uh, maybe the most important layer in a tandem is the recombination layer, which goes between the low and wide gap perovskites. Um, you have to electrically connect the subcells with this layer um, by efficiently recombining holes from, from one cell and electrons from the other. And a couple of design considerations. You do need to make sure that this recombination layer isn't too conductive laterally, so you avoid coupling the shunts. You also need to block ion diffusion between the subcells. And it also damage to the bottom cell during processing of the top cell. There's, so there's a lot of competing requirements, um, optimization, optimization variables here for the recombination layer, and that's why um, we've spent a lot of time working on making this um, a, a very high-performing recombination layer. And finally, the optics are really important here. So if you change the short circuit current a small amount in a tandem, it actually has a much bigger impact for tandems than for single junctions. So we need to optimize the layer thicknesses and optics to reduce optical losses and match the subcell currents. Now, that's obviously true for a two-terminal two primarily, uh, for the, the current matching at least. So obviously this whole stack needs to be made using low-cost materials and manufactured at, at high throughput. So here's an example of a real all get tandem stack um, work done by Axel Palmstrom at NREL and two of my co-founders, Giles and Thomas and many other folks, many of our collaborators at NREL, um, this was yeah, made, made into a very high efficiency, flexible cell. And really what these tandems, um, perovskite, perovskite tandems open up is the possibility of making really nice looking solar products that are as lightweight and flexible as wrapping paper, right, with better performance than state of the art. So it's this combination again of, solar, of, of, of this high efficiency of the lightweight flexibility and affordability that really opens up the new opportunities for solar that we, that didn't really exist before. So we've been heading in that direction, um, designing very lightweight PV products based on these perovskites. Um, this, these pictures are for single junctions, but certainly you could do the same thing for tandems. Um, and a key piece of this is uh, making a lightweight package. So you need to, again, because of the, the substrate and the packaging dominates the weight, you need to have very lightweight um, packages with good barrier properties to make these very high watts per kilogram products. You can see they're obviously very flexible as well. So that's great. Um, if we want to put perovskites a bit more into context, we can compare them with other PV technologies. Um, so starting with silicon, right? Efficient, very long lived, very low cost, um, but not lightweight at all. Cattel is actually very similar. Um, SIGS is efficient, can be lightweight, long-lived, but uh, generally has had troubles getting to very low costs. Um, organic solar cells, efficiency is, is a downfall there, uh, but they can be very lightweight and have other properties like being transparent or colorful, um, and stability or, or long lifetimes are still under development. Three fives, as I mentioned, very efficient, very lightweight, um, generally quite stable as well, but um, cost has been the Achilles heel there. So if we look at perovskites, uh, single junctions um, have pretty solid efficiency and can be very lightweight and, and low cost as well. Stability is a challenge. Um, I think tandems are what we find exciting in that they can kind of check all the boxes, um, doubly in this case. Uh, so you can reach very high efficiencies, over 25% for modules, possibly over 30 in the long run. Um, lightweight, you can get to over 2 kilowatts a kilogram if you do the right packaging and use perovskite tandems, all perovskite tandems. Um, they can be quite long-lived, we believe, in the future, um, still under development, though. And ultimately, they can help reduce the cost of, of solar um, on a per kilowatt hour basis. But the big question for perovskites is always stability, right? Will they last 25 years? And the short answer is, I don't know. 
Um, I, I think perovskites have a good chance of achieving these 25-year lifetimes. Um, and one data point is the experience of silicon, cattail, and SIGs. A lot of PV technologies that have started out unstable and ultimately been able to reach 20-plus year lifetimes. So their history seems to suggest that once the technology moves from uh, commercial production into deployment, um, the stability problems usually will get solved over time. Uh, maybe that's because of more focused engineering or optimization efforts or more field experience. Um, obviously, this is true only if stability problems aren't caused by some fundamental, unavoidable degradation mechanism, which doesn't seem to be the case necessarily for perovskites. Um, so I think our best bet there is to understand where all the holes are and start filling them in systematically. And none of this really means that stability ever stops being a concern. But for a lot of other technologies, it seems to have become just one of many variables to consider in product design and testing, whereas for perovskites, Stability is that one big cold shower that we take in every commercial discussion. So the stability issues aren't clearly fundamental, but they're far from trivial to solve. So I do want to come at this stability question from a few different directions, um, starting with a bit more history. So in the US, we've had three major programs um, for solar R&D, research development and demonstration uh, before SunShot. And this really started in the, the oil crises years in the 70s. Um, but the, the one I want to highlight here is the flat plate solar array program. Um, that was the first major program here in the, in the 70, from 75 to 85. Um, this was very relevant for stability deployment, uh, development for silicon. So if you look at this, this project, this program, um, the goals were really to, to build a reliable and standardized silicon module design uh, with relatively high performance for the time, long lifetimes, and reasonable costs. And the way this worked was that DOE funded industry silicon R&D and then bought modules. Um, so they, they bought the modules and then FSA researchers at JPL and elsewhere tested them. And the test results were used to improve the manufacturing processes. And there's a lot of exchange between industry, academics, government, nonprofits um, to really uh, develop this technology and develop manufacturing. And I, I see a lot of benefits from, from block buys. Um, there, it, it really encouraged the PV industry to use the latest technology um, it did evaluate modules using a uniform test or series of tests. And importantly, it actually created these close collaborations between the manufacturers and the evaluators, which led to really fast learning. So in this 10-year period, we saw um, module efficiencies, warranties, and costs improving dramatically. We saw a lot of foundational technologies um, and process, manufacturing processes developed for, for silicon. And I think a lot of industry experts, I wasn't around then, but certainly a lot of people say that um, FSA was foundational to the terrestrial PV industry. So if you look at where FSA started, um, these are typical solar modules in, in 1975, silicon modules. And they're actually maybe not that different from, from the kinds of perovskite modules that you're seeing today. Uh, but over that 10-year period, we saw across these five different block buys a quick evolution to the, the commercial format that we see today for silicon. So the cell packing factor increased. Um, we saw module efficiency, power, um, and costs all improve quite dramatically. And probably most importantly, it helped make silicon PV reliable. So if you look across this, this program, it helped reduce module failure rates from over 20% to 0.1% in the, in the last block buy. So there's a few possible takeaways for perovskites. Um, field testing is, is obviously critical. Uh, we need to move from passing the standard qualification tests to understanding how perovskites specifically fail in the longer term, and then design the qualification test to evaluate those failure modes and design solutions to mitigate them. Um, obviously, perovskites can benefit from a lot of the reliable designs that were developed through FSA and the thin film programs, things like substrates, interconnects, encapsulants. Um, and maybe other kind of meta-learning is that gov government coordination if it's done right, can do a lot to push PV technology forward. So perovskite companies and researchers need to work together to advance perovskite reliability. And I think it's going to take government and national lab support to coordinate this kind of program. Maybe a slightly different perspective. Um, this is some nice data from a, a really great analysis by Dirk Jordan and Sarah Kurtz uh, over at NREL. And it shows that historical, um, these are mostly silicon module warranties, have often been way out ahead, about five or more years longer than the longest published field tests at the time. So that's interesting. Um, 
Yeah, to be clear, I'm not saying anyone should go and warranty perovskites to their heart's content today. That'd be really bad for the industry. Uh, but there's some precedent for selling PV without fully proving out the warranty lifetime in the field, as long as the science is reasonably well understood. So if we look at how perovskite solar cells might break, um, to try to understand that science, there's a lot of different mechanisms, so intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms that we need to understand and, and solve. So a lot of intrinsic ones, um, which happen even in inert conditions, there's structural instabilities in the perovskite, which can lead to decomposition. There's thermal stresses, which can cause the organic cations in the perovskites to leave, to sublimate, um, and also cause delamination between any of the layers in the stack. Ion diffusion can happen and leading to, to these contact and halide reactions, which tends to cause shunts and defects in, in the cell and reduce performance. Um, we can also have light-induced instabilities, anything from halide segregation to de-alloying of the perovskite um, to defect formation. Right, so these are all possible under light, which um, is, is a problem if you have a solar cell. And certainly there's extrinsic mechanisms like moisture and oxygen ingress. Uh, which can lead to decomposition as well. So for the intrinsic things, you you basically just want to tune your perovskite compositions uh, carefully. You want to choose your contact layers carefully and design internal barrier layers in many cases to try to block that ion motion, which is unique to the perovskites. In terms of the extrinsic mechanisms, um, the probably the simplest design strategy is just to choose good packaging solutions. Um, certainly, the better we can do in terms of in terms of intrinsically stable perovskites. Um, the better off we are from an extrinsic perspective as well. So there's a lot of key stability tests that need to be done. I think light and heat, um, high temperatures, high, um, high intensity uh, light is very important. Um, it's particularly important for perovskites, but certainly things like damp heat, UV, thermal cycling, and combined stresses are all important tests. And it's important to know that you, you actually need different tests for different applications. So a space product has to be radiation hard, for example. So as if we've been able to pass, um, just to give you an example, we've been able to pass damp heat tests with flexible packaging. Um, so this is just over a thousand hours, the efficiency change for tandems and wide gaps and low gaps. Um, and obviously going for these flexible applications makes stability challenges more challenging. Uh, you can't just use, use glass as a barrier, but we are, making very good progress here. So what's the outlook on stability? Um, I think, personally, I think it'll take a few more years to prove out this 10 plus year field performance and reliability, and then you have to prove bankability as well. So it's not gonna be a fast process either way. Um, so shorter lifetime applications like these, you know, space or UAV, things like that, um, are already in reach today, but if you really want to go after the longer term applications soon, um, I want to show one possible strategy that you could consider to get perovskites into the market sooner. So the context here is that DOE and others often say that we need 50 year life modules to hit the sunshot targets, um, to hit our climate goals. But we've seen that PV technology has just keeps getting better, better and better consistently and rapidly. Costs are coming down, um, efficiencies are going up, and degradation rates are going down as well. So we're at a point now where the module hardware and the module installation are actually only a small fraction of the total cost of solar, and that's especially true in the US. So if this balance of system, these non-module costs dominate, then you might think that a long module lifetime maybe isn't as critical because you can take these shorter lived modules and actually replace them one or more times during the system life, given that most of that infrastructure is already in place, at least in theory. Right, so you can upgrade these modules periodically with better and better modules. And obviously this is particularly important if you start out with a shorter lifetime. So we did some basic LCOE calculations um, with NREL benchmark pricing data for US PV systems. Um, this is on the left here for a standard, um, sorry, a standard uh, operating strategy for PV systems. So you incur a bunch of costs up front as you do with a PV system. You have some at the end to decommission. Um, this is for a 100, 100 megawatt utility scale system. Um, you can see in red here, the efficiency of the modules degrades over time. And this is within warranty, but it, it, it does degrade over time. Um, the degradation rate here uh, is constant because you have the same modules, so per percent per year. 
um, the capacity degrades alongside the modules. The, the AC capacity is, is usually, um, sorry, the DC is usually oversized compared to inverters. So that actually stays constant and the generation falls off slightly. So if you go ahead and include module replacement, you can see if you imagine one replacement event at year 15 here in the middle, you incur module and inverter costs, you incur some installation costs um, at that time, but it's relatively small compared to the upfront cost, especially with BOS. So at that 15 year mark, you get to jump up in efficiency to where you assume modules are at that point. Degradation rate is a lot lower um, or can be a lot lower. And in this case, you know, you jump up your capacity as well, both in DC terms and as you upgrade your, your inverter or when you replace your inverter, you also upgrade. So the AC capacity jumps as well. And that's when you get to a, a step up in your generation. So if we go ahead and compare a few different options for PV technologies, we can start out with commercial technology. So this might be a silicon or a thin film, commercial thin film module. Um, you can compare that with a low cost hypothetical module um, in green here, which has a lower price. Um, but also slightly lower efficiency and higher degradation rate. And then a third case where you have a high efficiency emerging technology, which you know starts out a higher price, can go to lower, has a very high efficiency, um, going even higher, and starts out with a high degradation rate, in this case, a 10-year lifetime to start and, and improving over the course of these 30 years. So if you look at how these perform, um, without module replacement, you see that in general, the, the emerging PVLCOE tends to be higher um, by about 15 or 16 percent than the standard commercial PVLCOE for all the system types. Uh, but if you go ahead and replace the modules every 15 years, the LCOE for these emerging PVs, this levelized cost of electricity, it actually becomes highly competitive, right? So it's the blue one here compared to the black here. Um, and importantly, as you go longer term, this gray one assumes that you don't replace but have the ultimate performance uh, for these technologies. You can do better with these emerging technologies than even commercial technologies that are extrapolated out in performance. So the core idea here is to think of modules, PV modules, as an upgradable technology and not just this one-time infrastructure investment. So by doing that, you can make modules that are short-lived, um, you know, start out competitive actually with, with long-lived modules. So again, this emerging PV with even a 10-year life to start, as long as it's improving quickly, um, can have an LCA that's competitive. And obviously there are a lot of caveats to this. Um, the module replacement concept isn't always economically favorable. So you need to do detailed financial modeling for specific systems. Uh, as a general rule, you need the efficiency gain over your installed modules to be large enough to justify that extra cost of replacement. And you need lifetimes to be improving as well. Um, we'll probably need module recycling uh, to reduce the environmental impacts of, of you know, doubling the number of modules you're using, for example. Uh, backward compatibility is going to be an issue where you need to be compatible with the structural or electrical BOS. Otherwise, you're not leveraging that existing infrastructure. You might need new interconnection agreements, transmission upgrades to accommodate the higher generation capacity. Um, you know, there's the risk that you get a higher cost of capital because you're using a new technology which might actually negate um, the LCOE benefit. And certainly there's not a huge amount of pure economic incentive to do this. You can see the benefit is still not that great compared to just continuing to use silicon. Um, so until you reach that long-term end game, it's actually not a, not a huge advantage um, in terms of LCOE. So I think government support for this strategy might be one approach to de-risking and scaling up new technologies at a reasonable cost. But ultimately, this concept of module replacement can let PV technologies like perovskite tandems or perovskites in general, which could have very high performance but are unproven, enter the market without that 25-year life. So clearly, there are a lot of challenges ahead. Um, I just want to leave you with a different perspective on perovskites and the future of solar. So when I'm feeling particularly nerdy, I do like to think of Swift as a nuclear fusion company. Um, they've also raised a lot of money, a lot more money than solar, so maybe that's that's a good way to frame it for, for our investors too. Um, but we, we like to call this modular remote fusion, right? And this is actually a fact. The sun is a free fusion reactor. We do wireless power transfer across 100 million miles, which is pretty remote. And our modular technology is going to be the lowest cost collector of solar energy. So in short, we're making the cheapest fusion reactor in the universe.
So I'll actually lean into this a bit. Um, what I think is actually very cool about light, starlight specifically, is that it's the energy carrier of choice in space, right? That's it. There's no real other option. So if so if you're going to use this, I mean, PV is really the best way to convert energy from this form that the, that the universe likes, electromagnetic waves, to a form that humans like, or electricity. So what's cool about that is that any technology that we build today to capture the starlight here on Earth, perovskite or otherwise, if we make it good enough and efficient enough, this technology that we build today can really benefit humanity for all time. And that's no matter where in the universe we go. So we've actually done the synchrotron test with our colleagues at Cambridge um, and found that perovskites are in many ways actually the best technology for Mars and for space. Um, in a lot of early tests, they can survive proton irradiation, something like five times better than today's leading space technology. They can be a lot lighter weight and an order of magnitude lower in cost. So that means if Matt Damon here had perovskites instead of this old satellite 3.5 technology or these super heavy panels, made out of weird reflective silicon cells. Um, if he had perovskites, I think Matt Damon would have had a way better time on Mars. So with that, um, enough of Matt Damon. Uh, to wrap up, Swift Solar has a world-class technical team with technology and the markets that we expect will let us scale up sustainably and profitably. Um, but more importantly, I think for everyone out there working on perovskites or other emerging technologies, um, I do think we're on the frontier of an incredible opportunity to build technologies that can serve humanity for a really long time, um, no matter where we end up. So yeah, thank you again to the SWIFT team and our supporters, to all of our collaborators at NREL and Cambridge and elsewhere, uh, to the US MAP team and all the industrial members, and to all of you for listening in today. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Thanks, Joel. Joel. This was really interesting. I uh, definitely appreciate the Matt Damon references at the <laughs> end. Um, we we don't have a lot of time for questions, um, but one that has come up in a couple different forms is related to recyclability and end of life. And I think that this is, uh, to me, a really important question, given that you're recommending a module replacement strategy. So. What are your thoughts on opportunities for recycling perovskite cells, and do you see a path forward for kind of what the end of life looks like for these? Um, it's a great question. I think it's going to become particularly important as we deploy a lot of it, obviously. So in the early years, it's it's not a not a huge deal. I think in terms of recyclability, um, we haven't done much work on this. I think there's a, a lot of interest in it. Um, so there are a couple of points, I guess the actual raw material use in here is relatively small. So that's that's one small comfort. Uh, but certainly as we go and deploy a lot of this stuff, um, it's, it is going to be a concern. So I think it, there, there's some early work that shows that, you know, you can pull out a lot of the constituent materials, um, the lead, lead halides, um, the, a, lot, a lot of the raw materials that come out of this, these modules. So you can break it down. So I guess the way we look at it is if you um, – if there is that demand for it, which we expect there will be eventually, um, we can develop recycling programs um, with partners to actually reclaim modules and and break them down. So I think in terms of the environmental impacts of, of this kind of module replacement, um, we did a bit of an analysis here looking at life cycle impacts on the environment. Um, so with thin, with silicon, I mean, you certainly have some you know ma major impacts um, in, in all cases actually from metal depletion because these different PV technologies all use uh, critical materials, metals, um, but in many other categories, including carbon emissions and and kind of toxicity and all kinds of things uh, from an environmental perspective, adding uh, module replacement actually is not so bad. For silicon, it obviously increases dramatically, but for CATL and SIGs, um, it has a relatively low life cycle um, impact, and that's going to be similar for perovskites. They are manufactured in a similar way, um, use very similar module structures. So I think from that perspective, replacement isn't going to make a huge difference. Um, Recycling is going to be important either way. Great. Um, another question here uh, that I have interest in, so I'm going to be biased and ask it. Um, how much outdoor exposure testing have uh, you conducted so far on your samples or modules? Um, great question. Uh, we 
have a small test going on, I think, in Giles' living room. But otherwise, we have not done much um, outdoor testing. Um, it's mostly we, it's, it's a very high priority for us, and I think that's something that NREL and US Map can help with a lot. Great. Um, I like that answer. Um, and then I think a, a nice question to kind of wrap up as we approach the hour. Um, in what time frame do you see solar and renewables completely replacing uh, non renewable sources on the grid? What's your prediction? That's my prediction. Wow. Um, uh, I think it's going to be somewhere between 2035 and 2050. Not sure yeah. if that's a, a, a good answer. <laughs> it, it's a fun estimate. I think I asked Joe the same question. I think he was a little bit more optimistic. So um, we can decide on the uh, bet conditions later. Um, mm -hmm. But good to hear. Um, Harrison, we've just hit the hour. Is there anything you want to mention? Uh, Joe, I think you're chiming in. Well, no, I was just going to say I, I would totally defer to Joel since, you know, he's got the, uh, the uh, business experience and acumen. I would defer to a lot of other people who know a lot more than me. So appreciate that, though. Going out on a limb. We've got people in the chat saying anywhere between 2030 and 2050. Um, we should take a, a survey of the community at some point and see who's right. Um, I think it's fun. It's fun to think, think about. Make, I think we can make that happen on the web page, maybe. Yeah, I think we should yeah, do we it. Set up, we can um, set up Joe, a anything? <laughs> Cool, let's do it. Um, guys, anything to add um, as we approach the end here? Um, just a reminder, we will get the recording posted next week on the US MAP website. Go to News and Events and then click the link to the webinars page um, to find that. Um, and stay tuned for we, our March webinar. Uh, we'll also post that on that page once we get it prepared. Excellent. Um, and do check out the US map uh, webpage. We'll be uh, also posting about uh, for potential companies uh, interest in, in, in if you have staffing needs, uh, the NREL uh, postdocs and graduate students um, are having an event that, that uh, will feature there as well. So um, I just want to thank Joel again for uh, spending some time with us. Um, I think it was a really, really great presentation. I especially like the power beaming, I must confess. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you all.